In this lesson, we'll discuss how to predict products for double replacement reactions. Please have your periodic table and polyatomic ions handy, along with the solubility rules you received in class. Recall that in a double replacement reaction, two compounds react to produce two new compounds. A precipitation reaction is a specific kind of double replacement reaction. This is what we will be looking at in this video. Our reactants are going to be two aqueous solutions. Notice how they're labeled AQ. And then our products are going to be another aqueous solution and our precipitate that's going to be labeled as a solid. Remember with double replacement reactions, we have two replacements that are occurring. A replaces C and C replaces A. Or B replaces D and D replaces B. Part of what we're going to be doing here is to determine if a chemical reaction will even occur. So will our two aqueous solutions actually form a precipitate? If so, then we have a double replacement reaction. How do we know if a precipitate is formed? We're going to be looking to see if one of the products is insoluble, meaning incapable of being dissolved. The insoluble substance will be our precipitate. If both products are soluble in water, then that means we don't have a chemical reaction at all. No precipitate is formed. If one of the products is insoluble, then we have a precipitation reaction. We're going to label the precipitate with an S for solid, and then the other substance uh, will be soluble in water, and it will be labeled with an AQ for aqueous solution. Here is a list of the solubility rules that you received in class. No, it is not necessary to memorize these, but these rules will tell you what's soluble and insoluble in water. Water is our solvent here. If we look up a compound using these solubility rules and we find that it is insoluble, then it's going to be our precipitate in our double replacement reaction. We're just going to practice looking up a couple of compounds before we start looking at the double replacement reactions. So we're going to look up these compounds to see if they are soluble or insoluble in water. And first we're going to start with the mercury 2 sulfate. Down below here I've copied the rules that we're going to be looking at, but these are the exact same rules that are on your solubility rules sheet. We're going to be looking at rule number 6 for sulfates. Most of the rules deal with the anions in the compounds. Rule 6 says that sulfates are soluble except for, and there's a few exceptions, and this mercury sulfate is one of them, and it says that those exceptions are insoluble. So if this was a product in a double replacement reaction between two aqueous solutions, this would be our precipitate. Next, let's look at ammonium phosphate. If we look at the phosphate rule, number seven, it says that phosphates are insoluble except if they have ammonium in them, which this one does, and that it would be soluble then. So if this was a product, in a double replacement reaction between two aqueous solutions, this would not be our precipitate because it's soluble in water. It dissolves in water. We could also look at rule number one, which deals with ammonium and group 1A elements. It says that they are always soluble. So still soluble for ammonium phosphate. 
Now let's look at some double replacement reactions and predict uh, if the reaction will occur or not. If it will, we will write the complete chemical equation and then balance it. So remember the idea behind double replacement is the two replacements. So in this case calcium and lead are going to switch places or you could do the iodine and the nitrate. It's up to you. So the calcium and the nitrate are going to go together. Calcium has a plus two charge. Nitrate is a negative one. And then the lead and the iodine are gonna to go together. Now lead has more than one possible charge. If we look at it in this chemical formula with the nitrate, we can see that it is a plus two charge. So the chemical formula will be PbI2. Iodine has a negative one charge. So the next step is to look up these two products to see if one of them is insoluble in water. And if so, that's our precipitate and we have a chemical reaction. Look at the calcium nitrate first. Look at rule five on your solubility rule sheet. That is the rule for nitrates. It says all nitrates are soluble. So calcium nitrate is not our precipitate. For the lead iodide, look at rule number four. That's the rule for iodides. It says they're all soluble except, and there's a few exceptions there, and that PBI2 is listed. It says it's insoluble. So that's gonna be our precipitate. So we have a chemical reaction here. We're gonna label the precipitate with a little s for solid. And the other product, the calcium nitrate, gets a little aq, meaning that it's dissolved in an aqueous solution. And then the last step is to balance the chemical equation, but this one is already balanced. No additional coefficients are required. Next, let's look at a potential reaction between lithium hydroxide and barium acetate. If you swap out your cations, you get lithium acetate and barium hydroxide. Let's use the solubility rules to look up our products. Rule number five is the acetates. All acetates are soluble, so that will not be our precipitate. Rule number nine is for the hydroxides. It says metallic hydroxides are insoluble, but there are a few exceptions. If you look at where barium is on the periodic table, it is in group 2A, and it is underneath calcium. So that's going to make it soluble. Both of these products are soluble, so they're not products at all. This is not a chemical reaction. It does not form a precipitate. So we write no reaction. We're not gonna balance this chemical equation because it's not a reaction. Next, let's look at a potential reaction between ammonium sulfide and cobalt-3 bromide. We would get ammonium bromide and cobalt-3 sulfide. You can tell that the cobalt has a plus three charge by looking at its chemical formula. So now let's look up the products on our solubility rules. Bromides are rule three. Bromides are soluble with a few exceptions. Ammonium is not one of them, so ammonium bromide is soluble. Let's next look at rule 10 with the sulfides. Sulfides are insoluble with a few exceptions. Cobalt is not in group 1A or 2A, so we're not really talking about any of the exceptions here. So the rule as written is all sulfides are insoluble, so insoluble means that we will have a precipitate and we will have a chemical reaction. Label the cobalt sulfide as a precipitate, label it with a little s for solid. 
The ammonium bromide gets a little AQ because it's an aqueous solution. And then don't forget to balance the chemical equation. You have two more examples on your note sheet. Please try those on your own. Make sure to determine if you actually have a chemical reaction first, then uh, write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction if it occurs. We will go through the answers in class.